see schedule on, on the board here. Uh, I sent you guys the EOP, uh, the EOC bill schedule yesterday. So um, just um, understand that uh, they made a recent change. It was 6712, and now it's 1267. Uh, the important dates here is that uh, Monday and Thursday, we're taking um, putting our multiple choice tests into two dates, Monday and Thursday. So again, Monday, uh, multiple choice, um, just over derivative topics. So pages one through eight, 13 through 18, those are the corresponding pages. Um, uh, the Thursday test is the integral topics, second semester topics, and also multiple, multiple choice questions, 30 minutes. Uh, calculators allowed. No formula sheet provided. Uh, I'm grading multiple choice as for response. And then if you want, if you finish uh, the entire packet and you're still looking for some additional review, I would say, uh, you know, start working through packet six because you're uh, making progress towards uh, getting that um, packet six grade, but then you're also um, doing some additional practice review for uh, Monday, Thursday test. Okay. Uh, I will have a, a morning health session on Monday, uh, Monday 7:15. Um, I assume that most students will probably want to uh, be. Uh, assume that most students will probably want to be uh, at home. With, so I'll send out a Teams link. Uh, I'll send out a Teams link on uh, Monday if you want to join. Uh, I I am I do have uh, the um, video from last year going over. Pages 15 through 18. So I will send that out to you um, by Sunday so you can, if you want to look at it ahead of time. Okay. Um, I got this from um, uh, from Miss uh, Miss White, and uh, just wanted to make sure uh, to share this with you. Uh, that in preparation for AP exams, uh, she said to please remind students to bring the following on test days. So bring blue or black ink pen. Bring a number two pencil. Non mechanical, please. So I'll write that in non mechanical. Uh, approved calculators for specific exams, um, small snacks for breaks, and then water. Um, says please um, do not bring the following into the testing locations backpacks, cell phones, AirPods, your Buds, Apple Watches, Fitbits, etc. I mean, most I feel like most of this um, probably drive. So if you do, just leave your phones and backpacks in your car. Um, it will just um, make the process go a lot smoother. Okay. Okay. Uh, you guys picked up this um, AP exam uh, details uh, handout, and I just I will go over this in more detail. Um, after after we take our uh, AP test next week, but encourage you guys to just glance through it, um, uh, look through it, and uh, I think I went over the uh, the format of the of the test. Um, and some things I want to bring up is that uh, there's 45 multiple choice questions. Oh, and by the way, um, if you're working through packet six, it may feel daunting seeing some of the multiple choice questions. Uh, go all the way up to uh, like 92, um, but that's just because they uh, the 17 questions or sorry, the uh, uh, the 15 uh, depends on the year. Sometimes it's 15, sometimes 17. They they start on at a different point on the Scantron, so it looks like there's a, a ton more questions, but it's only you know, 45 total. But um, you know, if you're working through packet six, you know, some of the problems may look like they're in the 80s and 90s, but that's because they they split uh, up uh, for uh, in the Scantron. Okay, so uh, there's 45 multiple choice. Um, uh, pre response is six pre response questions. Every pre response question is nine points each, so nine times six is 54. 
um, but to make it so that multiple choice and free response are equally uh, weighted, um, they're making uh, 45 times 1.2. And so that's that's able to get that 45 question go to 54 points. And that allows um, uh, the, the two portions to add up be, uh, to be equally weighed and adds them to be 108. So this is uh, just a score distribution from this particular year. Uh, you know, every year it kind of changes, but it kind of gives you an idea as to um, um, the range of percentages to earn a, a three, four, and a five. Um, so I've seen uh, for a five, it can range anywhere between 62 to 68 percent. It really just depends on on how the score distribution is for that year and how they are, um, you know, splitting it up. But um, uh, so every year is a little bit different. Um, and to get a four, it's usually in that low 50 percent range. Uh, correct, and then to get a three is in that 36 to 38 um, percent to earn a three on the exam. Uh, you know, this is a, a very generous, you know, uh, it's a generous curve to earn a three, four, five, but I don't want you to underestimate the um, uh, the difficulty of this test. I think even getting a three. I consider that an accomplishment. You know, um, if you get a three on the AP exam, you are demonstrating that you have a good knowledge um, of the course that you just took. Um, and you know, I know that threes a lot of times doesn't earn you uh, college credit um, for certain colleges, but still, I consider three um, an, an accomplishment. Uh, uh, just also understand that. The, the 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 questions that you see on the AP exam, they're not going to be super easy. Like you know, what's the derivative of three x squared? You know, nothing as easy as that. So you know, all the questions are going to be kind of like in the medium um, to to difficult range. So as you guys uh, practice more and more multiple choice, you're able to kind of see the, um, um, the 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 depth of of some of these questions. So. Um, I have um, a series uh, of tips and advice on uh, page uh, two, which I will probably go over a bit more uh, after we take our multiple choice uh, test next week. But I do encourage you guys to read through. Um, I do have uh, maybe some points that I um, duplicated uh, because I made another testing tips advice in a separate year. Uh, and so just, uh, yeah, um, but hopefully, the repeated information will just be additional, which just be additional reminders. Uh, so that go, goes all the way to page four. Um, and then pages five through eight, uh, I just wanted to uh, provide uh, a way for, for students to be able to practice um, memorizing their derivative and integral rules in a kind of a structured way. So I put all the, um, uh, the, the similar uh, formulas together uh, so you can see some patterns and uh, on page seven and eight I have the keys uh, for uh, each of these rules so these are all the derivative and integral rules um, chances are you're not going to see all of them show up on the AP exam uh, on page nine I'll, I also have additional page of uh, just a formula sheet for you to to practice with um, but I consider the the absolute necessary formulas to memorize are on page 11. Uh, this is not all of it, but if, if I were to just narrow down to the top eight derivative rules that, that show up over and over again on AP exams, these are the eight. Um, and then also integral rules, um, I narrowed it down to uh, six or seven. Um, but ideally, um, if you're able to, you're able to memorize all the formulas, but uh, if you um, um, just want to do the bare minimum, I would say, uh, look on page 11 and page 12. Okay. Um, any questions that you guys have right now for uh, about this, um, about your exam? Okay, so uh, in your packets, um, we went through pages five and six. Uh, I, I checked pages seven and eight. Um, so a lot of page seven and eight is uh, particle motion, and a lot of uh, a lot of it is calculator. 
uh, work. I do want to point out a couple of things here. Um, number 10 on page um, 7. I see some students um, have a little bit of trouble with this, and it's not because it's hard. I think it's just because we forget some parts of the process. Um, so number 10, it says, uh, given the second derivative function, find the points of inflection. Well, we know points of inflection is where we set the second derivative equal to zero. So that's pretty easy. This is already second derivative. So if I set each portion to zero, I'm going to get zero, negative one, and two. But here's we got to be here's where we have to be careful is that zero, negative one, and two are just critical points. We haven't quite confirmed that these are points of inflections yet. We have to go to a, a sign line, test each subinterval, and make sure that there's a change in sign. Only if there's a change in sign can that critical point turn into um, uh, a point of inflection. So notice that two at two, there's no change in sign. Concave up to concave up, um, there's no change. So if there's no change. That's not a point of inflection. So point of inflection is only at zero and negative one. But if you look at the answer choice, you can see that um, you know, their uh, prime C students can will will, will fall for that for that trap. Um, you know, looking at that critical point uh, and not going far enough to get to the points of inflection. Right. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then on page 12, there's a lot of calculator involved uh, problems. Uh, being able to use your calculator to find x intercepts and knowing what that x intercept represents on the derivative graph. Um, so hopefully, guys, hopefully as you guys work through this, you're able to practice on your calculator um, so they can get comfortable with it uh, for this next week's test and also for the AP exam. Uh, any questions that you guys have on um, any problems on page seven and eight that you want me to go over in more detail? Okay, so if you think of anything, just let me know. Uh, I'm going to um, have us look at pages 13 or just flip over to uh, the near the end of the packet here. So 13 through 18 here. So I, I, I want to go over some more uh, miscellaneous um, uh, first uh, semester topics, and those are derivative of inverse at a point and linear approximation. So that uh, spans between page 13 and 14. So we'll spend a good chunk of time, page 13 and 14. Um, but just to let you know, pages 15 through 18 is the morning review uh, for Monday. So I'm going to save this for Monday. And uh, these are the 11 topics that you really want to try to make sure that you know how to how to do. So pages 15 through 18 uh, is the morning review for day one of our test. And again, I have this video on my website from last year, so I'll send you guys a link um, to that. Um, um, on, I think on Sunday so that um, if you guys are working through it and if you have any questions, you can kind of go to it and and, um, and, and have another set of resource uh, before before Monday. Okay. So uh, page 13. I think I did uh, go over this um, as we were reviewing first semester topics uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, but just to remind you that uh, derivative of inverse at a point, uh, there's a very uh, specific relationship. That I want to review with you. And it's the idea that um, if I have uh, two functions or two functions that are inverses of each other, uh, there's a special relationship in terms of their order pairs. So if there's an order pair that lives on one function, the inverse is going to have a flipped order pair that lives on that graph. So there's an order pair that's one four on one graph, and there must be an order pair or one on the other graph, assuming that they're inverses of each other. So that's the relationship from an order pair perspective. They're, um, I call them corresponding points um, where you're always going to have uh, flipped order pairs across all between, if you compare all the order pairs uh, between a function and its inverse. Okay. 
the X is the Y of one and Y is the X of the other. Now at these corresponding points, there's also a special relationship in terms of the steepness at that point. Uh, so the slope of at this point, I'm going to call it seven and the slope at the corresponding point on the other function is going to be one seventh. So at the corresponding points, uh, the big idea is that the order pairs at the corresponding points are flip flop, but then also at their corresponding points, their steepness will also be flip flopped. So, uh, but from a fractional perspective. So if one has slope of two thirds, then the other has slope of three halves. The signs stay the same. It's just that um, the the numerator denominator values are are flipped. OK, so. I like to um, use this chart to kind of uh, keep track of my progress. Um, so you're uh, always looking for this piece of information. So you're, you're going to start off with this being the unknown, and then you're going to kind of work your way around this chart. And then by the time you get here, you will have enough information um, to determine what the slope that you're looking for. So number one, it says uh, f of x is x cubed minus x plus two. Find the derivative of f inverse at two. So I'm going to um, start by using a, a chart here, indicating that this is what I'm looking for, the derivative of f inverse of two. I know two is the x value of my inverse, so I'm going to create, I'm going to let um, my top row show that relationship between uh, inverse and a function. So I know the uh, f inverse of two, the order pair at two is some y value, but if the if two is the x value of my inverse, then two must also be the one, the y value of my f function. Okay, so I know that this is true even without doing anything else. Okay. So my next goal is to figure out what the x value of my function is. So I know what the y value is, so I'm going to use that to help me figure out what the x value is. I'm going to replace two and for the y of my function. I'm just going to work backwards to figure out what the x is. Okay, so my y is two, so two is equal to x cubed minus x plus two. Um, combine the twos together, I can factor x cubed minus x, factor an x out. I'm left with x squared minus one. Continue to factor x plus one, x minus one. Solve for x, I get zero, one, and negative one. Now, typically, it's not as messy as this, where you got to choose between two, three x values. Um, but either way, um, once we identify an x value, we're going to find the derivative, find the slope, and then whatever that slope is, we're going to uh, uh, flip that value around. Um, but if we look at our answer choices, our answer choice is going to be one half, two thirds, th uh, four, and six. So let's find f prime first and just kind of plug in to see which one will have that relationship. So f prime, uh, what's f prime going to be? 3x squared minus 1. Now it could be at 0, 1, or negative 1. So if I plug 0 in, I get 0, 3 times 0, 0, 0 minus 1 is negative 1. If I flip negative 1 around, I still get negative 1. So I don't see that as an option. So uh, 0 doesn't quite work. If I plug 1 in, 3 times 1 squared is 3. 3 minus 1 is 2. So I think that's going to work. If f prime of 1 is equal to 2, then if the slope of the f graph is 2, then the slope of the inverse at 2 must be what? Must be 1 half. Yeah. It's a coincidence that these are the same numbers. OK, so can't always guarantee that. Okay. Number one is a little messier than uh, than usual because you usually you're not going to have deal with three separate options to solve uh, to figure out what the x is. Okay, so it's, uh, the rest of this page is just um, um, practicing through this concept. So hopefully by the end of this page you'll um, you'll feel a lot more co uh, comfortable um, with this sp uh, specific topic. So number two, it says let f and g be functions that are differentiable everywhere. G is the inverse of f. If g equals three, g of, if g of three equals four, and f prime of four equals four, uh, three halves, then g prime of three equals. So we're looking for g prime of three. I'm going to start um, building information into my table. So I'm looking for g prime of three. I know three is the x value of my g function, but three must be the what? 
the y value of my f functions. So even without looking at anything else, I know I can get at least to this point, and I'm just going to fill in the blanks. OK, so this is a little bit easier because we don't have to do a whole lot of uh, work. We just have to kind of uh, fill in uh, where the pieces go. So f of what equals 3? Well, actually, uh, we know uh, we have something related, right? We know that g of 3 equals 4, so we can fill that in. The g of 3 equals 4, then therefore f of 4 equals 3. And if we have the x value, then we can use that to build our derivative. We know that we want to target the slope of the F graph at four because that's going to lead us to the slope of the G graph at three. So what's F prime four? Okay, F prime four is three halves. So if F prime of four is three halves, then we're almost nearing our answer. What's G prime of three going to be? Two thirds, that's right. Keep the sign, just flip the numerator denominator around, but don't change the sign, OK? If we change the sign, that, that's, that's a different relationship. That, that's officer reciprocal. That's perpendicular lines, OK? But here, uh, the slope is going to stay the same signs. OK, questions with two? All right, number three. I'm going to start at the end. That's what I'm looking for, the derivative of f inverse of two. So from this information alone, I can put at least this much down. Okay, so um, what can I fill into this space here? F of what equals two? Negative three, so I know not imperative to put it here, but it just kind of helps me establish that relationship. Order pair negative three two on the f graph. Order pair two negative three on the inverse graph. Okay, so if I can find f prime of three, then this slope will lead me directly directly to uh, the derivative of f inverse at two. So f prime of three, I'm sorry, negative three. F prime of negative three is three fourths. So. If this is three fourths, then this is four thirds. All right. Um, number four. Start at the end. OK, so um, I have to go to the function to find that x value. I know that the y value of my original function is at 2. So I'm going to put 2 into that y slot of my equation and work backwards. I'm going to solve for x. Subtract 1 from both sides. 1 equals natural log of x. Raise both sides with e as the base. E and natural log goes away. I'm just left with x. x equals e. So I can fill that in. f of e equals 2. f inverse of 2 equals e. So f prime of e is really what I'm looking for, because if I can find the slope of f prime of e, then I can figure out the slope of the inverse at 2. So before I can find f prime of e, let's find f prime of x. Okay, 1 goes to a Zero, natural log of x becomes what's the derivative of natural log of x? Okay, natural log of u becomes I remember u prime over yeah, u prime over u, right? So the derivative of natural log of x is just 1 over let's see let's review the derivative here
So the derivative for natural log of u is u prime over u. So the derivative of natural log of x would just be what? Prime. One over x. Yeah, one over x. Okay. So I'll make sure that we still remember those rules. Okay, so f prime is one over x. So therefore, f prime of e is one over e. So if my derivative on the f graph is one over e, the derivative of f inverse of two must be what? Just e, yeah. Okay, it's a coincidence that these are showing up as the same value, but we can't guarantee that this, these patterns will exist. So um, to make sure you um, are understanding the path that we took around that table to get to our answer. Okay, any questions with that concept? It's not hard, but it is a very specific procedure uh, to get to the answer, right? All right, uh, let's do linear approximation on the next page. That's, that's the other um, miscellaneous topic. Uh, we've seen linear approximation a, a lot on the FRQ, but uh, this is uh, on the multiple choice side of things. Same concept, but um, the, the work feels a little bit different. So this is the whole uh, purpose or the whole idea here. With linear approximation, your, your first goal, your main goal is just, can you create that tangent line equation? So uh, you want to find order pair and slope, and the slope comes from the derivative equation. So at the beginning, you don't even concern yourself with a decimal value. Just get to the tangent line equation, get the order pair, get the derivative, get the slope. Build your tangent line equation, and at the very, very end, then that's the easiest part is to plug in that decimal. Okay, so, but don't involve that decimal until you get to your tangent line equation. Okay, so number five, it says the approximate value of uh, y equals root one minus sine x at x equals negative one, uh, x equals negative point one is obtained uh, from the line tangent of the graph at x equals zero. So right now, we're just going to focus on the uh, curve and the x value. Okay, don't worry about the decimal. Okay, so we need to gather the order pair and the slope so we can build the tangent line equation. So whatever this curve looks like, we're trying to figure out the equation of this tangent line so that we can use this to make an approximation uh, of the curve. Okay, so uh, let's find the order pair first. So y of zero, and insert zero into the function, uh, replace x with zero, what's sine of zero? Zero, one minus zero is one, square root of one is one, so there's my order pair. Order pair is y of zero equals one. Okay, to find the slope, I need to get to the derivative. To get to the derivative, what specific rule do we have to make sure we involve here? Yes, square root with multiple terms inside. What, uh, what concept do we have to involve here? Chain rule, right? So one minus sine x raised to the one half. Obviously, we have to involve sine's derivative, but there's a function within a function here, right? So let's build our derivative here. Y prime equals one half parentheses to the negative one half. Multiply by the inner function's derivative, negative sine x becomes what? Well, one goes to zero, right? Negative sine x becomes negative cosine of x, okay? Now that you have your slope formula, let's get to the slope. So y prime of zero, one half, one minus, we know sine of zero is zero. Okay, it looks a little messy, but it cleans up nicely here. We have one, one raised to the negative one half, that's still gonna be one, one times one half is one, one half, sorry. What's negative cosine of zero? Negative one, so negative one times one half is negative one half. So y prime zero equals negative one half. Okay, so we have um, the information that we need to build our tangent line equation. We have our order pair. We have our slope. 
Now we can do our tangent equation. So y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So the hard part is building that tangent equation because the linear approximation is not much more than that. So y minus 1 is equal to negative 1 half x minus 0. OK, let's get y by itself. I mean, I can drop the zero if I want. It's not, it's not needed. But now that I have a tangent equation, now the linear approximation comes into play. So all you're doing is you're just inserting that negative 0.1 in for the x. That's the easiest step. The hard part is building that tangent equation. Okay, so negative one half times um, negative point one uh, becomes negative um, uh, or positive 0.05. 0 0.05 0 0.05 plus one becomes 1.05. Okay, let's practice uh, this a few more times. Uh, number six. The approximate value of y equals 1 over root x is at x equals 4.1, obtained from the line tangent to the graph at x equals 4. So focus on building your tangent equation and don't worry about your slope until the, don't worry about your decimal until the very end. So find your ordered pair, get the derivative, find the slope, point slope form. Easiest thing to do first is to get that order pair. So we insert four um, x equals four into the x of my equation. So one over square root of four is uh, root four is two, and then uh, one half. So my order pair is four one half. I'm just um, finding my order pair using my function. And then next, I need to get to my derivative so I can get to my slope. This is um, I would much rather go through product uh, power rule than quotient rule. So I'm going to bring that x up to the top, then go through power rule, then put the x back down to the denominator, and then I can put in my x value. So y prime of 4 is negative 1 over 2 times 4 to the 3 halves. Uh, 4 to the 3 halves, we can deal with this. We can work this out by hand, not too hard here. Um, Deal with the 2 first, the square root of 4 is 2, 2 cubed is 8, 2 and 8 becomes 16, so our slope is negative 1 16th. So you have your slope, you have your order pair, now you can put it into point slope form. Now once you have point slope form, then the easiest part is to put in that decimal value. So now that you have y equals negative 1 16th times x minus 4 plus 1 half, replace the x with the decimal, and then try to get it down to one of those answer choices. OK, number seven and number eight, I think uh, is manageable. The same process, right? 
focus on getting your order pair, getting your derivative, getting your slope, point slope form, and then save the decimal until the very end, right? The, the linear approximation should be the easiest part of the process, um, assuming that you are focused on building that tangent equation first. Okay, um, so uh, you guys can practice that on your own. I just wanted to make sure that uh, you guys are good with uh, the steps and the concept here. Uh, I do want to um, start a little bit with um, second semester's material, uh, just because um, after the quiz on after the test on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday are going to be um, you know half period. So uh, I want to make sure to at least get a head start if possible. So again, pages 15 through 18 is your morning review. I will do that Monday morning, 7:15. I'll send out a, a link. I'll send out a reminder on Sunday as well. Uh, but I encourage you guys to work through pages 15 through 18 ahead of time as a way of preparing for Monday's test. And if you want additional practice, go to pay, go to packet six. You have a ton of multiple choice problems there. Pick out the derivative questions and you have the key. You can work through that just for additional practice. Okay, so uh, let's go to page nine. OK, so page nine. Uh, Nine through twelve are going to be your second semester topics, and then page nineteen through twenty-two uh, will be the morning review that I will say for either Wednesday or Thursday morning, depending on when I have time. Uh, now the topics don't feel like there's as much in the second semester, but it's a little misleading because um, in order for us to do a lot of second semester stuff, we need to have all the first semester material as as the foundation. So. Um, it just, you know, everything kind of builds on the first semester. So, uh, but the specific topics for second semester are Riemann sums, first theorem, second theorem, average value theorem, uh, integration rules, use substitution, solving differential equations, and then area volume. I know it's been a while since we've done an area volume, uh, like this method, washer method, cross section. So, um, I'll definitely spend a good chunk of Tuesday and Wednesday making sure that we're comfortable with those concepts before you see them again on Thursday. OK, so let's look at uh, number one here on page nine. The graph of F is shown. And so here's the graph of F. It's a graph that's increasing. It's also um, uh, showing as concave up. Let R, let L, R and T represent left Riemann sum. That's for L. R, big uppercase R is for right Riemann sum. And uppercase T is for trapezoid sum. Um, and we want to put them in the following order, which will produce the smallest approximation and which will produce the largest approximation. And then the integral from 0 to 4 of fx dx, what do you think this represents? Yeah, this is the exact area under the curve. Okay, so where does that fall? Is it so um, again? Uh, so here. Now, this is a problem that we don't want to have to memorize, right? Don't memorize, oh, the increasing with left Riemann is going to be decreasing. It's going to be um, an approximation. We want to be able to, to sketch the graph out and convince ourselves. Okay, so um, I drew the graph multiple times and want to kind of show you, make sure you can um, build it uh, or understand how you can, how we can build this. So page nine here. Okay, so here I, I drew the, the, the three uh, variations here. I built the trapezoid approximation, I built the right Riemann sum, and I built the left Riemann sum. And then uh, it's all supposed to be the same curve, uh, increasing and uh, concave up. So uh, first, with uh, trapezoid approximation, uh, well, trapezoid approximation is, is, is really accurate because you can see that um, even if I'm just using four trapezoids, and I'm just connecting the tops of every um, um, point, it's already pretty accurate, right? Uh, you see minimal gaps between um, uh, the curve and the trapezoids. Now, the trapezoid is going to be slightly overestimating, so we'll keep that in mind. It's a slightly overestimating, a little bit larger than the actual area. Okay, a right Riemann sum, that means every subinterval, I'm attaching the right endpoint of every rectangle. 
and letting that be the height of that corresponding rectangle. So we can obviously tell that for an increasing function, Brian Riemann's sum is going to over approximate right, by quite a bit, right? It's going to be most likely the largest approximation amongst the ones that we have. Okay, uh, left Riemann sum, this is where for each subinterval, you're attaching the upper left corner to the curve and letting that be the height of each subinterval. You can tell that these are inscribed rectangles. This is going to be the lowest approximation. So we have the lowest approximation here, followed by the exact area, followed by a slight over approximation, and followed by an obvious over approximation. Any questions there? Okay, let's see if we can squeeze one more problem in. Uh, let's look at number two. So this is meant to be non-calculator. So let's uh, talk about the steps here. So uh, for time t is greater than equal to zero, the height of an object suspended from a spring is given by h of t. What is the average height of the object from zero to two? So uh, average value theorem is uh, the, the concept that's tested here. So average value theorem, one over b minus a, integral from a to b, So my A and B value are provided. There is my average value theorem. I replace A and B with zero and two. Replace H of T with 16 plus seven cosine power of 14. We can just make sure we keep, uh, we'll bring that one half back, but we kind of leave it out of the process so we can focus on the interval here. Um, okay, so these are two separate problems here because there's that plus sign here. So what's the integral rule for 16? 16 becomes what? Antiderivative, uh, we've got to make the degree rise, right? So 16 becomes 16. Yeah, 16 x. So uh, here we're using variable t, but yeah, we're going to make it to degree one, right? 16 becomes 16 t. But here, integral of 7 cosine power over 4 t, I got to go through a little bit of what? All right, there's a bit of messiness inside the parentheses, so I got to go through what process? U substitution, right? So my U value is pi over 4t, and most of our work is going to be um, having to get that um, 7 cosine of pi over t dt cleaned up. Okay, so uh, I'm going to just separate them into two separate integrals. So I understand that um, I'm really um, um, dealing with them individually with their own separate rules, 16 times 16t, but this got to go through U substitution. My U value is pi over 4t. Find the derivative, v over dt equals pi over 4. Solve for dt, dt becomes 4 over pi. Okay. I make my substitutions. Parentheses becomes u. dt becomes 4 over pi du. Push that 4 over pi out in front. And now I have a nice clean rule for me to apply. 28 over pi is a coefficient. And I'm just worried about having to deal with cosine of u. Okay. So what's the antiderivative of cosine of u? Cosine become sine. Yep, become sine. Replace the u back in terms of. Uh, we don't do the c because we have bounds, so we just have to take the antiderivative, um, and then now we can work in the bounds. Okay, so 16 becomes 16t. We found the antiderivative, and now we're working in the bounds. Okay, so upper bound first, two in for t, followed by zero. Um, so two in for t, 16 times two is 32. 2 in for t, power over 2, uh, power 4 times 2 is power over 2, sine of power over 2 is 1. The nice thing is the lower bound uh, will uh, just uh, wipe the rest of the terms out, so we don't have to worry about that lower bound too much. And then we just do some cleanup. Um, so sine of power over 2 is 1, 1 times 28 over pi is just going to be uh, um, 28 over pi, because sine of power over 2 is 1. Now. Is this the final answer here? We still have to make sure we keep track of the what. What do we have at the very beginning of the problem? That, yep, that one over B minus A. So don't forget about that. That is still part of your average value theorem. So if I multiply that one half through, one half times 32 is 16. 
half of 28 is 14, so 16 plus 14 over pi, that's the average value. Okay. All right, so um, hopefully you guys have some time this weekend to look over your notes. Uh, make sure you look over your formula sheet as well, right? Uh, memorize the formulas associated uh, with first semester topics. Okay. Uh, Monday morning, help session, 7.15 over 2. Okay, come and get your phones. Um, the reason I this topic is because um, if you're dealing with um, principal values, if you just see square root by itself, it's always one. The only time you're going to have to deal with them if it's like y equals x squared uh, or, um, or let's say y squared equals 4. And then if you have to be the square root of both sides of the equation, that's the only time you end up plus eight. Actually, you know, I'm going to have more books. Well, I won't be here on Monday. Okay. So, um, yeah, so you can figure out the time when you want to take it. Um, you know, all of the schedule is mixed up, so you can find the time to either come in Tuesday or Tuesday or after school. Okay, but I only have two cards. Okay. Yeah, so uh, give me a heads up. What do you think you can come in and take it? I mean, you can come in and take it anytime soon. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Most of that was like 12. Yeah, yeah, like 